Whoever wishes to be great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. Amen. Today we face perhaps the central teaching in the Gospel of Mark. Jesus is talking about status and the meaning of its status in our life. Quite simply, is it better for us as individuals and as a society to use power to dominate others, or should we act more like servants? And this question concerns every aspect of our social life, and you can see it built into the material world. I want to begin with two things that I love about San Francisco, and I'm looking forward to hearing what you love about San Francisco too. The first thing that I love about San Francisco are Victorian houses. Aren't they wonderful? 40,000 of them were built between 1860 and the year 1900. The writer Thomas Idala writes that, quote, the city was put together out of buildings that roar with fun, that never take themselves so seriously that they forget to smile. Victorian houses were built using the latest technology of the time. They were thoroughly modern and yet made to look old. And they were mostly sold to middle and working class people despite all the changes in the real estate markets. When I see them, I still, they still seem to me like wacky, eccentric mansions for ordinary people. Another thing I love about San Francisco are the Sutro Baths out at Land's End. Adolf Sutro loved to watch the waves breaking in Fisherman's Cove there. And so he started small by building a kind of aquarium there. It was 100 foot by 100 foot. And before long, he had 250,000 gallons flowing in and out of that, little, of that little aquarium. And then in the 1880s, he built a railway that started where the JCC is now today on California and Presidio. And a railway took people all the way out to Land's End. And he really wanted it to be for ordinary people. So his railroad cost only five cents per ticket versus the regular Southern Pacific line, which cost 20 cents per ticket. And it was his dream to bring people out to that place. And eventually in the 1880s, um, they, or in the 1890s, they finished construction of the Sutro Baths. Now to give a sense for you of the Sutro Baths, they were the, the largest swimming complex in the entire world. And this cathedral right here is 300 feet long, and the Sutro Baths were 500 feet long and 350 feet wide. They were an extraordinary thing. But the Sutros were not visionary enough and at the very beginning, they, they um, did not allow black people to swim in the pools. But fortunately for everyone, John Harris, one of the first people who was discriminated against in that way, sued them, and the courts held that, the, that he was right. And so for, for, for decades and decades, those baths were open to everybody in San Francisco. So on a, a weekend day, you could see 8,000 people gathered together there. Now, my point is that there is a kind of idea that you will see built into San Francisco all over the place, whether you're in Golden Gate Park or the Presidio or downtown. Even in the past, when we had more millionaires than other cities, even back then, people understood that radical differences in wealth destabilized community and made it harder for the ones who served to do so with respect. They wanted to make the really good things available to everyone. Now, I understand that our experience of inequality today in this particular place is deeply affected by markets and property arrangements, by the tax code, by things that are so far beyond our control. But at the heart of our experience in San Francisco today, there is something missing. We have lost our way. Now, you may have heard my opening comment and be thinking to yourself, but is status really what the gospel of Mark about? And you wouldn't be thinking that question if you had been able to read three chapters of the gospel of Mark instead of just that tiny section that we had. 
There's so much that was left out. And, and for starters, the, the whole verse began with Jesus walking ahead of everyone. Um, and as he's walking ahead, um, it said they were all very afraid. And it said they were all amazed. And then Jesus gathers the 12, the, the people who are closest to him, and he tells them exactly what's going to happen. That he's going to be handed over to their enemies. That he's going to be tortured to death. And then the very next line, James and John, the two of the innermost circle with Peter of Jesus, come to Jesus and they say, we want to be city, seated at your right and left hand when you come into glory. Now we all get the terrible a heart-wrenching irony about that, right? That Jesus comes into his glory when he's crucified on the cross. And despite being just told that this by Jesus, they clearly do not understand. Now, what makes us even more powerful is that this pattern of um, Jesus telling what's going to happen, people saying um, uh, that, uh, that, that he shouldn't, and Jesus re, um, re, reteaching them again, correcting them again. This pattern happens three times in a row. And the pattern happens between two stories at the beginning and the end about Jesus healing blind people. It's like this is a red flashing sign that, um, that, that Jesus is suggesting that those disciples had a problem seeing. They had the same problem seeing that we do too. The cross. The idea of a suffering Messiah who dies for the people. A new way to be human in which we no longer try to dominate others but serve them instead. These are very hard ideas for them and for us. On Saturday night, Heidi and I went to see Jesus Christ Superstar. And every time I say I've read something or seen something, I have to like preface it. I'm not recommending that you go and see it. But that's what we did. We saw um, Herb Jong from the 830 service. It was great to see him there. Um, but one of the most powerful parts of it for me was that in the Garden of Gethsemane, the last night before Jesus is arrested, Jesus is so terribly lonely, he really wants his disciples to stay up with him. And in the, in the musical, all the disciples, the, the, the three ones who are, he wants to stay up with him, they're all wearing headphones. And I thought, wow, that's it, isn't it? They're wearing headphones. They cannot hear Jesus. We are wearing those headphones too. Jesus gives his life as a ransom for many so that we can be free. Jesus tries to show us how to be free from our constant preoccupation with status. It's a preoccupation that destroys our life. And the cross, that cyn cynical instrument of torture and death, it cannot obscure this truth. The nations have rulers who lord it over them. Their great ones are tyrants, but it is not so among you. Whoever wishes to be great among you must be your servant. Now, it's a strange thing, but human beings are not the only creatures who are so governed by status Stanford professor Robert Sapolsky, who is my guest on the forum and preached here at this, in this very um, pulpit, um, he studies all the various primates, particularly baboons, and he knows that all primates, this is what we do. We lord it over each other. And through MRI studies, he concludes that primates are fantastically attuned to status differences. We recognize these status, status differences before we are even conscious of recognizing them. They happen in less than a blink of an eye. High levels of inequality make us less likely to believe that people can be trusted and less inclined to be part of groups, less likely to come to places like this in the way that we have today. Inequality erodes social capital, which is the trust, reciprocity, and co cooperation that we need to, to have in order to work in groups and to live in peace. High inequality makes us treat each other more poorly. Those people who especially value prestige and power, they seem less able to care for those who are less fortunate. Now that's just one side of it. The other side is even more horrifying. Lower socioeconomic status has an immensely detrimental effect on health. It's not just that the poor have bad health and everybody else is okay. 
Every step down the ladder means worse health. And it's not just because poor people have less access to health care. This phenomena is just as true in countries with socialized medicine as it is in other places. And it leads Sapolsky to conclude that the problem is the psychological stress of having a low socioeconomic status is what decreases health. Sapolsky concludes writing, when humans invented material inequality, they came up with a way of subjugating the low ranking like nothing ever before seen in the primate world. Now the question, of course, is whether Christianity is true, whether this is true. A central part of the Gospel of Mark has to do with the role that status plays in our life. We are like those headphone-wearing disciples, and we cannot imagine what it would be like to really be free of our attachment to status and power. But Jesus, he's not content to just leave us to ourselves. Jesus keeps calling us home to God. He warns us that our preoccupation with status as an individual and as, in, as a society is terribly damaging. So what do we do? It's a very simple thing. Learning to put others per first is the way that we begin to realize that promise of freedom that Jesus offers. And it's not at all easy. We're, we're entangled in our lives in so many contradictions. But church can help us to live in this new reality. We offer each other the chance to really act as if every single person has infinite value as a child of God. As if Jesus gave his life even for that person who most irritates us. In April of 1989, there was a funeral in St. Stephen's Cathedral, Vienna. The Empress Zita of Austria, Hungary, of Austria and Hungary, the widow of the late Emperor Charles I, who had died 70 years before, was being buried after living for 96 years. It was a two-hour service. 6,000 people attended. They sang Mozart's Requiem. And then they took the body and they went to the church, the burial place of the Habsburgs. And the procession arrived and the doors were closed. And the chamberlain knocked three times. And one of the friars said, who requests entry? And the reply came from a vanished Europe. Her Majesty Zita, Empress of Austria, crowned Queen of Hungary, Queen of Bohemia, Dalmatia, Croatia, Slavonia, Galicia, Illyria, Queen of Jerusalem, Archduchess of Austria, Grand Duchess of Tuscany and Krakow, Duchess of Lorraine, Salzburg, the list went on for 20 more sidles. And after all this, the friar replied, we do not know her. <laughs> Who requests entry? And he tried again. Her Majesty Zita, Empress of Austria, Queen of Hungary. And again, the reply came, we do not know her. Who requires entry? And this time, the Chamberlain replied, our sister, Zita, a poor mortal sinner. And the gates were thrown open. There is a desire in our hearts to live in equality, which I see built into the landscape of this city. But still, we lose ourselves in our ego. We hunger for recognition in a way that sets us at odds with others. And yet, Thank God for you and for me, the gates of this cathedral are thrown open for us. Now, in case you're tempted to despair because overcoming this is so deeply ingrained in our nature, you have come to the right place. For homework today, you're all sitting over there and before you leave, come forward up here and have a look at this window to my right. It is called the Brotherhood Window. And you remember the story of James and John, so misguided and wanting to be honored above all others. Not understanding what Jesus was calling to them to was a, a totally different kind of understanding of the Messiah. And James and John, there they are, 
on the right and the left of Jesus. Right here in this church that they could never have imagined 2,000 years later after they made this request. May the impossible contradictions in your life find resolution in God's holiness. Let us pray. Dear God, give us peace in the restless slumber of our egotism. When the thought of you wakes in our hearts, let it not awaken like a frightened bird that flies away in dismay, but like a child waking from its sleep with a heavenly smile. Amen.